Welcome to the ultimate four-wheeling video series. We're proud to bring you the very best in four-wheeling entertainment and have developed this series especially for you, the dedicated reader and fellow four-wheeling enthusiast. Each video in this exciting and action-packed series delivers the ultimate thrill of four-wheeling at its finest. Watch as driver and vehicle attempt to conquer some of the most challenging terrain, pushing the vehicles to the braking point and beyond. In this episode, you'll see Top Truck Challenge, where 10 of the world's most durable vehicles compete in four-wheeling's pinnacle event. Listen to the competitors' stories and watch as they brake and fix on the fly, adapt and adjust to the next big challenge. In this video, top trucks from the US and Canada will meet in head-to-head -head competition. They'll be sent over rocks and mud pits, leading up to the extreme four-wheeling nightmare, the tank trap. And at the end of the competition, we will know which truck stood up to the challenge and earned the right to be called Top Truck. These trucks are beautiful now, but they won't be by the time we get done with them. The ultimate four-wheeling video series will bring you a wide range of exciting entertainment, along with valuable information to improve your driving and four-wheeling skills. Sit back and join me in Hollister, California for this edition of the ultimate four-wheeling video series, where we start this episode with a ruler and a tape measure. Well, the angle of approach and departure is extremely critical to these guys trying to get over obstacles. They'll measure it in degrees. They'll look at the degree of departure and the degree of approach. And of course, the less overhang you have, the more opportunity you have to climb over big objects. 67.7. Go ahead. Well, this one is pure and simple. No fancy equations, just a simple measurement of the turning radius of every vehicle. And of course, tighter is better. Now, this particular portion of the competition is called RTI, Ramp Travel Index, and you gain points by dividing the distance up the ramp by the wheelbase of the truck. I haven't even stretched my spring out yet. He calls it Goliath. This bright yellow M38 hauled from Auburn, California. It's owned and driven by David Yulberg. I've had it for about three and a half years now. The history of it is I bought it in original condition from the original owner's son and I bought it for 900 bucks and drove it home. I essentially built mine for rocks, for driving on granite and big rocks and there's a lot of mud here so I've only had the thing in mud once. It's not a Hummer, it's a bummer. A fiberglass kit body stacked on a three-quarter ton 73 Chevy frame. It belongs to Aaron Clow of Erta, Utah. I built it mainly for the uh, family aspect of it. Uh, we do a lot of trails and sand dunes, and it hauls everybody and a lot of equipment. Uh, it's built on GM, so it's fairly simple to get parts and also cheap. It's got a good fuel-injected, light, small block motor, nice big tire with a bead lock. It's got lockers, front and rear, and it's, it's just really cool to be here. Not much better than sitting out here, getting ready to beat on it. Josh Perizzo of South Burlington, Vermont, drove across the continent to join Top Truck Challenge. His 93 Jeep Cherokee is nearly stuck from the floorboard up. The changes are underneath. I've always been a Jeep person. So the body's stock, the interior's pretty much stock, uh, in the transfer case. Besides that, pretty much everything else that was on it's gone. Having a hard time getting the height out of it for the tire size I wanted, so we had some leaf springs hanging around the shop for an FJ40, and uh, they fit pretty, pretty good. Made some custom spring hangers for the front. Changed the axle in the front, and put a Dana 44 out of a 76 Bronco. Sam Patton's CJ7 may have hot suspension, 39-inch boggers, and a tuned port fuel-injected 350, but Sam says it was also built for real life. We wanted to build a vehicle that was realistic and looked like something that could be, uh, you know, drove every day. And, and I mean, we could put a soft top on it and, and, and drive it every day if we wanted to because 
you know, the heater works in it, the windshield wipers, the speedometer works, and it's street legal. You know, we also wanted to beef up the suspension and the axles, so when we did go to the rock crawl challenges and events like this, that, uh, you know, it hold up. On the outside, it's a 62 F100. Under the hood, it's a 69 Olds 455, and owner Cliff Steelman runs his combination on 44-inch swampers. I was 15 and a half when I bought the truck. Shortly after I bought it, um, blew up the motor, so started working on it. So replaced the motor with another motor of the same type. Still didn't have enough power. Went to an Olds 455, had a granny four-speed in it before and everything, and just made it to where it's all come from idle up and even below idle because when we're running in the snow we'll we'll have it going so slow that the oil pressure is down to about five pounds. Brent Gigaber of Sumner, Washington owns this 1950 CJ3A. It's been half a century since Jeep built it and Brent says it needed a few improvements. Originally bought it for $500 from a customer I was driving home, saw it there sitting on blocks. Thought it'd be a great thing to take home and beat up, so we built it, a lot of it in our spare time. Been working on the new suspension, just put new uh, sway away coils in it and uh, nitrogen charge tanks and motor. Three buddies and I put that in. Edelbrock intake manifold, uh, it's a B&M blower. As soon as I put the blower on, had a definite overheating problem, so we went to a new radiator and twin electric fans. Paint job was done by my father-in-law. Front and rear winches for back home. Whenever we have any trouble, we can go either way. We built it for short, tight trails. We have turns, everything's trees in Washington, and lots of rain, mud. Um, this is completely different terrain. Jake Hallenbeck of Reno, Nevada, bought his 87 Suzuki Samurai as a weekend runabout, but quickly realized that he was desperately short on horsepower. Started pretty much as a little weekend beater, and over two years, it's just pretty much we've built it up, started debuting new stuff on it, and it's pretty much ground up now. Did Toyota 8-inch axles, 529 gears, and custom shackle reverse in the front with dual shackles in the rear. And then one thing we've been starting doing a lot of and trying to get it out is 16-valve uh, motor swaps out of Sidekicks, which doubles your power. Um, home's Reno, Nevada, and pretty much there's a lot of canyons there. So that's why we started the canyon crawlers. Steve Rumor's Sniper is the only tube frame vehicle in Top Truck Challenge this year. It features two and a half ton military axles and a Chevy 406 V8. The guys at the shop and myself, we get a lot of satisfaction out of building different things and uh, is kind of a guinea pig for new ideas for the shop. We decided to set the whole chassis up. It's two inches higher now than it normally is. We readjusted the, the coilover. Uh, we felt that a little bit higher center of gravity wouldn't hurt us. Do you get like Apollo mission jokes or anything about that? Yeah, moon buggy, is that approved by NASA? Yeah. Roger Bernard of Alberta, Canada fabricated the entire body of this vehicle himself. And this year, he's the only competitor to carry the maple leaf. Well, I came straight off the factory line from Calgary. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Trying to make it multi-purpose to cover all the aspects of four-wheel driving. The frame comes from a, a Chevy one ton, three plus three, which was uh, reduced in length by about four or five feet. The bodywork is my own design and just fabricated in my own garage. I've been doing four-wheeling for about 10 years, and really it was just from past experiences of what broke and what didn't break. Um, so I just tried to put it all in one package.
Kevin Kalen Scrambler has been a family affair from the start. His wife, even his kids all lend a hand, and they're the ones who came up with Siberian Stripes. Uh, usually we fold them every weekend and we get a chance. Uh, a lot of sloped hills, some rock, uh, some water crossings, there's some mud, but uh, prefer to stay on the rocks and the dirt is what we, we built the, the vehicle for. We actually cut it in half. I took a saw and cut it in half and stretched it. It was a CJ7 and I stretched the frame uh, and the body uh, 24 inches. How much blood, sweat, and tears do you have in this vehicle? More time than money, but plenty of both. So it's a lot of work. My wife and I, we're not painters, but uh, we actually striped that vehicle. 16 hours of striping. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be picked, and then we actually make the top 10. It's, uh, it's, it's an honor to be here. So I'll push it uh, as hard as I have to. Here's how they stacked up after the scores were in with the average ground clearance. The Bummer, the Roger Build, and the F100 rounded out the top three. The angle of approach and departure went by a wide margin to the Sniper in first place, followed by the Flatty and the CJ7. The Sniper's four-wheel steering came into play on the turning radius measurements. Again, an easy win for the Sniper, followed by the Flatty, and this time the Cherokee. And in the wheelbase, Ram Travel Index measurements, the only competitor to top 1,000 was Goliath, followed by the CJ7 and again the F100. Next, in the engineering and show and shine competitions, our competitors get a chance to impress the judges with their engineering prowess, showing off such things as steering design, axle strength, gearing, lockers, and the appearance of the engine bay, the interior and the exterior of the vehicle. In the engineering department, Sam Patton's CJ7 came out on top of the Sniper and the Samurai. They nailed down the first three positions. In the show and shine competition, it was an easy win for Kevin Kalen's Scrambler, followed by the Suzuki Samurai and Sam Patton's CJ7 in third place. The last event of day one at the Top Truck Challenge is the Ride and Drive, where competitors take the judges on a two-mile ride on paved roads throughout Hollister. Jake Hallenbeck's Suzuki Samurai turned out to be a joy to drive, even on the roads. It was followed by the CJ7 and the Bummer. Well, here's where our top truck drivers get to play drag racer. This is the acceleration and braking testing. Now, in order to complete this portion of top truck challenge, we've come all the way out to Hollister Airport and commandeered one of the aircraft runways. Now, we've marked off a certain portion of it, and these guys get a chance to nail the throttle and go as fast as they possibly can. Then, when they're done, we turn them right back around, get them up to 40 miles an hour, and this time, see how quickly they can stop. We've got uh, a couple little motor bugs, and uh, we're going to give it our best shot.
Now the toe test is where things really get tough. You gotta have a lot of horsepower to make this work. Now Anthony Terry is our cat driver and he's got a bird's eye view of the whole thing. And this thing weighs 17,000 pounds and it's got this huge steel cable. Follow me along this cable and right in the middle of it, you're gonna notice a big link. Now they've tried to lengthen it as much as possible so that they would have an opportunity to tear up as little ground as possible because these guys have to have good solid footing to really get going. On your mark, get set, go. Great. <laughs> Got all dirt in your lens. <laughs> surprised at how many people have already made it to the top. Uh, have you have you done anything like this before? Uh, no, I've done a little sand pulling, uh, but this isn't no caterpillars yet. A lot of wheel spin on the takeoff, and we've really had some guys struggle to get out of the hole, but it seems like once they get on the hill, once they start to get up the incline and build some momentum, that's when they really take off. And it looks like he's going to be yet another guy to take this thing all the way to the top. Congratulations. at the bottom may just be a little looser. I think that's mainly from previous competitors, but that's not his only problem. Looks like Dave broke a drive shaft, broke a front drive shaft. Now tell me what happened on the way up. You, you obviously lost the drive shaft, but uh, did it handicap you too bad or were you already up? Uh, it handicapped me a little bit, slowed me down, but full throttle and get it up here. I got a big rear end, we moved. Jim, it almost looks like it didn't actually break. No, the spline pulled out of the yoke uh, as part of that long travel suspension as it went down, it went down so far that it allowed the spline of the drive shaft to pull right out of the yoke of the transfer case. Is that just problems with the flexibility that the chassis has to absorb on the way up the hill under that pressure? Yes, it is, and oftentimes that's countered by creating longer sp splines for those drive shafts. The toe test is usually a distance competition, but this year the field was so strong, 10 out of 10 competitors made it to the top. The F100 did it quickest. The frame twister was next. Now it may look easy, but looks are definitely deceiving. The twister is roughly 50 yards long and starts out with two deep water holes that only swallow one side of the vehicle. After that comes a bed of rocks and logs that must be traversed. Adding to the difficulty is the fact that the logs are placed unevenly, so the driver must rely on a combination of momentum, finesse, the proper line, and luck to make it through. Exactly harder than it looks. This event has a 10 minute time limit per competitor. Now running over a cone, leaving the perimeter of the course, or winching will all add 20 points to your score. Having to stop will add one penalty point, while backing up or having anyone exit the vehicle will result in two penalty points. That means the competitor with the lowest penalty point count and the quickest time is your winner.
Jim, here's a truck we expect a lot of. And here's a guy that expects a lot of himself. Steve Rumor came into this with a tremendous amount of confidence. He can take one look at the design and see why. He has tremendous flexibility, big, big tires, soft tires. There he goes. He just made it through. Steve, I'm really surprised that you attacked those last logs as hard as you did. I thought you might have broke something. I wasn't really about breaking anything. I just wanted to get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> My plan was to, to get in the, the logs and just shoot diagonally straight across and keep the tires kind of alternating back and forth. And that last one spun us straight. And then we got snagged, so we had to keep working it. Well, Cliff Steelman pulled all the way from Washington for this, and he ran into some early problems there, Jim, as soon as he got to those logs. That's right, but you can see what happened was he didn't have his, his rear lockers in. Reached up, flipped a switch, and then he went a few more locks. And I think he's got the worst possible wheelbase combination for this. And now he's doing a little strategy here. He knows that this is only 20 points to winch the rest of the way out. Well, Sam Patton's going to give it a go, and uh, this guy is bringing a Jeep product out. we got a lot of Jeep products out here this year. That's right, we do, and uh, Sam has a reputation for hitting things hard, and you'll see he, will, he has earned that reputation quite well. Uh, and Sam uh, seldom breaks. He prepares his rigs very carefully, and, and uh, this Jeep has a lot of very strong components under it. Boy, it better the way he's treating it. He really abused that thing going over the first three logs. And now they've decided to get up here and Step winch aside. as quick as they Step possibly aside. could. They had to think this strategy out in advance. That's right, they did. And, uh, so that's what we say. Sometimes it's an advantage to go first, second, or third. Other times, the later competitors figure out, wait a minute, uh, we will be able to make more points, which is this is a points-driven event by doing just what Sam did. And he sends mud flying everywhere, even our direction. And a big congratulations. Got to be one of our quickest competitors through this time. Jim Pyatt told me a minute ago, he said, this guy has a reputation for hitting things hard. <laughs> yeah, that's, this is what we do in Oklahoma, so we're used to this mud. <laughs> so this, it doesn't hold any surprises for you at all? No, no, this is what we do. <laughs> well, uh, once you got to the very end yes, and you stalled out on the last log, I noticed that your spotter immediately jumped straight out. Was that a pre-planned strategy to, to uh, winch? Right, yeah, because everyone's been getting stuck on these last logs, so you know we knew we would too. So. We had everything ready and just tried it one time, and then when it wouldn't go, he went out and, you know, hooked up to the cat there, and we got out. Aaron Cloud gets the go sign and drags uh, one of the biggest machines that we've got out here across the frame twister's beginning. Now tell me if that's going to be an advantage or a disadvantage to have such a big wheelbase. Well, in this case, it may be an advantage because he may be able to get those front wheels over that last log before the back wheels hit the other one. But uh, here we are. He's uh, found another couple of logs that are matching his wheelbase, and therefore he is stopped at the moment. Jim, up next we have Kevin Kalen in the Scrambler. Oh, there he goes. He's gotten it on an angle, and the wheelbase monster has bit him. And it looks like he may be hung up on some drive shaft under there. Yes, it, yes, he has, and he's taking the strategy of let's get that winch out and let's move this vehicle out of here. They'll winch, they'll take a 20-point penalty, but was it worth it? Figured we'd pull the winch cable just as quick as we could and get us out of there. It threw us for a good little loop there. Once it bounced us to the side, we know he's in trouble. Just go ahead and winch it out. If we'd have broke something and we'd be in there working on it in the dirt and covered with mud, uh, we'll take the 20 points for the winch. Well, David Gulberg was the next competitor, and he tried something that was a little out of the ordinary for a short wheelbase vehicle. He tried to attack the log straight on instead of going sideways. Well, they got high centered, got hung up before he even reached the final log, and they tried to winch out as quickly as possible, but the winch wouldn't cooperate. They had difficulty with their winch. They eventually did get out, though, but their difficulties weren't nearly as bad as the ones experienced by Josh Perizzo. Josh got hung up after he stranded himself on a log, broke his drive shaft, and he had to be pulled out the old-fashioned way. Josh became one of three competitors to run out of time in the frame twister. The time limit was 10 minutes. Sam Patton's CJ7 came out in first place, followed by the bummer, and then Kevin Kalen's scrambler. On your mark, get set, 
go! Decked out in goggles or rain suits or whatever they brought, the competitors were told to get ready for the mud pit. Now it's time to get dirty. Well, those of you who are experienced Top Truck Challenge fans know that the mud pit has changed quite a bit. In fact, take a look down here with me along these pylons. This little berm right here last year was completely covered in water. I mean, we had water three, four, five feet high in some places down through the mud pit. Well, this year, that's not the case. You have to deal with the mud, and that's all. Instead, they put the pylons up so you cannot use last year's strategy of trying to have one tire creep along the side of the wall and pull the rest of your vehicle. Doesn't work that way this year. You get in the mud, you get dirty like it or not. Last question before you go out. Do you hit it as hard and as fast as you possibly can, or do you feather the throttle? Wide open. Kevin, you promised us a wide open show and you certainly delivered. Would you have done it any other way? Uh, yeah, I would have liked to stay straight. I think I could have done a lot better. Would it have turned me sideways and drugged the belly sideways? I was pretty much in trouble. Well, you know, we're all very proud of him, but I just, I don't want to give you a hug, Sam. You know, I mean, <laughs> congratulations. That was a really nice room. Man, you are Thank fixed you. up here, though. I was prepared. I was prepared. Our strategy was to uh, go in there and try to get on the left side and ride that bank a little bit, and it paid off. Got real lucky. Had plenty of tire speed, so just kind of ran out of room. Well, it looked like your strategy paid off. Now all you have to do is figure your way out of those clothes. I know, I know. I need to get clean. <laughs> Nobody made it through the entire mud pit, but Sam Patton's CJ7 went 96 feet. The sniper and the flatty tied for second. And now we have a small rock collection for our competitors. Or actually a 135-foot stretch of six-foot boulders that we call the mini Rubicon. The rules are exactly the same as they were with the frame twister, with the exception of a 20-minute time limit on the mini Rubicon as opposed to a 10-minute time limit. Also, a 20-point penalty for those who cannot make it out under their own power.
David Hulberg's luck went from bad to worse to much worse in the mini Rubicon. In the opening seconds of the competition, he snapped a drive shaft. He had to run all the way up the hill into the parking lot to retrieve a new drive shaft, and he slips coming back down. The ankle injury forced David to both clutch and break with his left foot. An obvious major disability in the mini Rubicon, but it didn't matter. They popped another drive shaft and ended up winching themselves home. The next competitor was Josh Perizzo, who brought his Cherokee out and encountered an identical problem to what he ran into in the frame twister. It was the front drive shaft that eventually let go about 20 or 30 feet into the mini Rubicon. Not to be dismayed, they carried on as best they could with rear wheel drive only, but they eventually had to be hauled out. Well, Kevin Kalen wants to make this worth his while. I mean, this guy hauled 50 hours from South Carolina. Yes, he's a, he's a good uh, good thinker. He has a well prepped machine, and he's uh, he's really he, he does a careful job, but an aggressive job at the same time. And the guy tossing around the rocks here is his co-driver Robin Stover. There's an interesting story how they got together. He didn't have a co-driver, and a gentleman from out here was chatting with him. At the end of that chat, this gentleman became his co-driver. So the fellow who's out there helping him and running and and just doing everything he can to help him is someone he just met. But despite the fact that they just met, they work very well together. This is one of the more methodical runs that we've seen, but don't let that deceive you. These guys are making very, very good time out here. I understand that you guys a few days ago had not even met. Tell me the story about how you got together with Mr. Kalen. Well, he was pulling his Jeep out of his trailer and he needed some help and I came up and offered a hand. I don't know much about rocks, hadn't really been on them much, and uh, he's familiar with them and he really, really helped me out. You give credit where credit's due. All I did was turn that wheel the way he told me to. He deserves all the credit. There's a lot of mud and stuff, so you know we like to do things different. So going to the rock crawl challenges, uh, which is completely different, uh, prepares you for you know the staggering of the rocks and makes sure.